Okay, so um, my name is Mike Foody. I'm the CEO of Global Imagination, and this is the Magic Planet. Um, it's the most engaging and effective way to learn global information. This is a two-foot system. We make them in 12 different sizes from 16 inches all the way up to three meters in diameter. That's like for Disney and rock concerts and, uh, and so on. Uh, so I'm going to walk you through the different ways it can be used in a school. And I'm going to do it from the standpoint of three different people, real people. The first is Joe Kearley, a, uh, a teacher. The second is an 11-year-old girl named uh, Shannon. And the third is the person in the Chinese Ministry of Education responsible for all new technology going into, uh, going into Chinese schools. Um, <coughs> so from the standpoint of, uh, of Joe Kearley, um, she has to contend with students that play video games, that use iPads, have, uh, have smartphones, and, uh, and so on. So she began using the, uh, the Magic Planet for some of her lessons to, to help with that. Um, so I'm going to walk you through a lesson about uh, tsunamis. Um, one of the first things that we have this large library of professionally Early developed in content. The of December 26, 2004. A so, powerful earthquake shook Indonesia. I'll just let this run for a second. Followed by a massive tsunami that spread out across the Indian Ocean. Over 220,000 people lost their lives. There was no official tsunami warning system for the Indian Ocean in 2004, and many didn't recognize the natural warning signs. On the island of Sumatra, in the village of Jantan, half of the people perished when the tsunami leveled their village. In contrast, on the tiny neighboring island of Simalua, all of the villagers of Langi survived. Why the difference? So one of the ways it gets used is uh, to get kids interested in the lesson. The best of these movies ask questions. They don't necessarily answer them, but they get kids thinking about, um, about the topic. Um, <coughs> and it's often used in the center of the classroom with everybody all around. Um, so you guys can see the back and the fact that it's, it's, uh, it's all the way around. Um, so Ms. Kearley found it really pretty easy to use because she just has to, she just had to walk through her, her lesson and the Magic Planet automatically updated to, uh, to match. This um, first one is um, an animation we got from one of our customers, Noah. They did this and we had it within about a week of the, of the uh, Japanese earthquake available to all the schools and all, the, um, all our customers to to uh, help explain. So what you see here is the, the, highest, val the highest height of the, the waves from the tsunami. So right here is really high. Uh, red is not quite as high, and yellow is, um, is uh, where it's, the waves are starting to decrease. These black lines, pretty cool. This, is, this shows how long it took the wave to get a particular distance. So this is uh, after six hours, after eight hours, and after 10 hours. So the first thing this tells you about a tsunami is that it's moving at 500 miles an hour, the speed of a jet. So it got all the way from, uh, from um, uh, Japan to Santa Cruz in, uh, in nine hours. Now, Santa Cruz was hit very badly. There, there were people swept out to sea. There were, uh, there were boats turned over. And so why is that? 100 miles north, 100 miles south, the damage was, was not so much. Well. Um, what we can see right here is that there's this line of red going straight at Santa Cruz, California, this line of higher waves. Let's pretend the ocean is a bathtub, and we'll pull the plug, and we'll, uh, we'll drain it to help explain why that is. All right, so what you can see is that there's this trench that funneled the wave, the tsunami, straight at Santa Cruz, California, and that's why it was so, uh, it was so badly so badly damaged. Um, this is a part of a, a big, long series uh, on um, earthquakes and on, uh, and on um, plate tectonics. So here we talk about the different types of, uh, of uh, plate movement and um, why, uh, what kind of fault caused it. Um, so for anyone that has tried to teach how the continents formed, this is an example that you just can't get. Uh, an understanding without seeing it undistorted on a, undistorted on a globe. So after the lesson, um, the the magic planet can uh, can 
be used by students to do projects. And this, uh, what you're going to see is a project that was done by, by Shannon. She's an 11 year old girl, uh, loves language arts, didn't like that many of the other um, subjects because they were dry, not that interesting, difficult to understand. And from her perspective, she didn't really have a good way to express herself. So um, you can see the, the cursor. Um, I'm just moving that on the, on the Magic Planet. Um, we have touch globes, but for this um, audience, it was just a little bit easier to use a mouse. So I'm going to, everything that was done on here was done by non-technical users, uh, Shannon, kids, teachers. Um, and I'll pick one example. So this was on uh, Egyptian art. But Shannon loves animals. She had that in common with, uh, with Ms. Kearley. So she did a project on how global warming affects animals. She got that animation from our library. She did her internet research. This is our media mashup tool. Uh, she added these links. She set the style. She's very proud of the style. It's called Space Toaster. Uh, and then she put together a, a presentation. This is her. Sea turtles lay their eggs on Brazilian beaches, many of which are threatened by rising sea levels. Climate change also, also threatens the offspring of sea turtles, as nest temperature strongly determines the sex. The coldest sites produce male offspring, while the warmer sites produce female offspring. This nest warming trend is reducing the number of male offspring and seriously threatens the per turtle population. Who knew? Um, so this is, uh, this is a really great little... Uh, little project. And from uh, all she really did is, so she worked on her own computer. She worked in a, on a flat map. She added the landmarks. Uh, she selected the media. And that's really, um, that's really all it took. Now, one of the other things about the Magic Planet is we have a large library. Can you um, change the resolution of that back? Um, we have a large library of, uh, of um, content from museums, planetariums, aquariums. And um, that library is available to, to schools. So in the context of enrichment, you can have some of the world's best museums, um, their exhibits in your, in your library for, uh, for enrichment. So for example, um, here we're going to show the, uh, the exhibit from the um, uh, California this is what Science the Earth Center. Looks like at night. Of course, this is a composite view. When it's nighttime on one side of the planet, it's daytime on the other. But with this view, you can easily see where people use the most so electricity. Typically, the, the way this would be used is with a... and constantly on the move. In this animation, arrows show how warm and cold ocean currents flow around the globe. The way the ocean waters move influences climate and living conditions for all of Earth's plants and animals. Notice the complex patterns the currents follow. These are affected by factors such right. as wind, water temperature, and salinity, the topography of the ocean floor, and the rotation uh, of the planet. Yeah, it's more that the, the uh, I have to set the resolution of the, of the monitor. Um, so <coughs> can you reset that so you can see the whole, see the whole thing? Uh, no, the whole um, uh, exhibit, that one. Uh, just take a second to, to do that. Excuse me. Uh, let's see. And see if we can restart it. Yeah, there we go. Uh, yeah, I was talk talking about the resolution on the, on the uh, screen there. OK, cool. <coughs> Good. Um, so. You don't have to go on a field trip. You have some of the world's best museum exhibits from the Smithsonian, from NASA, from NOAA um, in, uh, in, your, uh, in your library. Um, now, let me move on to efficacy. So there's a lady named Lu Chang in the Chinese Ministry of Education. And she ran, she got the Magic Planet. This is actually from her lesson on uh, uh, World War II history. Uh, she got the, the Magic Planet and began doing tests. She ran a test of 1,400 students over the course of a year, um, very carefully done, 700 in each group. That's the team that you see on there. That's the team running the study. Um, so that's Lu Chang up there with a the little arrow. So uh, what she found, there were 15 different lessons, religion, language around the globe, World War II, history, science. She found that overall comprehension went up by 16%. Remember, this is across 700 students 
uh, and 15 different types of lessons. Moreover, desire to participate in class went up by, uh, went up by 17%. So um, they've got 300 installed. There's 1,000 on order. They ordered 600,000, 2 million. I have an order in my hand for this year for $4 million. And she said that at $2,500, there'd end up being one in every Chinese school, of which there are over 400,000. Um, and more recently, they did a test against iPads. And they found that for the, for the 50 different lessons that they had, although they probably tested about 10, um, it was more effective than an iPad. So if we could do an 8-inch system, uh, at the price of an iPad, that start giving them out to every uh, to every uh, every student. Um, so a couple of different lessons that uh, that were learned learned from that whole big study. First, um, teach imagination as a skill. The when you think of uh, when a lot of people think of the Chinese school system, they think of rote test taking, but that's not where they are today. So. People that think China is just going to continue to be uh, to be uh, a manufacturer in for a in for a shock. One of the other things that they learned um, is it's very hard to get teachers to change to um, take new lessons. So what they did is they took the lessons that they were using, they covered the same material in the same time, and just swapped it out with something that worked more effectively. And that's a really great way of getting buy-in from teachers because it's uh, because it's so simple. Um, and I'll just leave you with, uh, with, this, last, uh, with this last thought. Welcome so to as, Welcome we to the, as we do the, um, this system at a price that can be $2,500, that can be afforded by almost every school, and do an 8-inch system, we still have the opportunity to, uh, to do a consumer system. And so I think there's a tremendous, uh, a tremendous opportunity to really improve the way people worldwide learn global information. Awesome. Okay. Well done. Let's hear it for Global Imagination. I guess we can put the lights up. Uh, thoughts from our panel? What did you think of the interactive globe? I think I need one to test. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and right into the microphones, guys. Betsy, have you seen it before? And what are your thoughts on it as a, somebody who covers the education space? Yeah, Do you I mean, buy it's the a, claims of 15% better retention education? <laughs> Well, I, I'll confess as a journalist, I'm always very uh, cautious about numbers like 15% increase in, uh, in uh, attentiveness and so forth. I think these, these numbers are a little, a little dodgy. But, um, uh, but uh, the, the display is really beautiful. Uh, there's certainly a kind of Harry Potter element that it uh, certainly would bring into the classroom. Um, I guess I have a couple of questions. Um, are you, how much of the curriculum are you actually building? How much can... Are you sharing curriculum from some <coughs> of the people who are already using uh, the globe Good in question, your yeah. classrooms? Um, yeah, so let me come at that from a couple of different perspectives. First, China, um, they've developed, the Ministry of Education has developed 50 different lesson plans that are shared throughout the country. Uh, <coughs> in the US, um, most of our production is going to China, so we've been working with schools strategically, and they do, and they do share. Um, the bulk of lesson plans are coming from our informal education customers, museum planetariums, <coughs> aquariums, like the Smithsonian, the American Museum of Natural History, and they build branded lesson plans that, again, they make available to, uh, to everybody else. But there aren't as many available in the U.S. And if I'm a teacher, just sorry, one quick follow-up. If I'm a teacher and I, I know of a site like the Global Telescope site or, sure. or something that I'm really excited <coughs> about, is it possible to actually port stuff from a website onto this, or is there a, a lot of fiddling that has to go on in between? Um, so we use the internet standard for global image. I mean, if, you, if you think of those rectangular maps that mm -hmm. cover the, the whole globe, mm -hmm. um, virtually all of them you just kind of download and they'll, they'll run on the magic planet. And then to connect it to like a PowerPoint. So the, the library we have is really, really big. I mean, it's, it's But if I, I guess to your point, if I had a video from YouTube, can I project it onto there, or would it not be in the right format? Okay, um, so uh, that's, a, that's your question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, like a video from YouTube, if you take a video and stretch it all the way around the globe, you won't be able to see all of it. Right. So that media mashup tool that we have um, can place <coughs> it either up there or in a window on the screen or multiple times. So how do you shoot maybe you video just explain to us how does it work? What is, what is, how is it projected? What what yeah. input do you need? What's inside the globe? Yeah. Show us the mashup. All right. <laughs> what happens if you drop it? So the way, it's, the way it works now um, is that there's a, a projector in there that's shooting light horizontally. Um, it goes into a mirror. We have this lens, which is a really 
fancy ass lens, I think uh -huh. the technical term. Um, <laughs> it, it covers 180 degrees, but it's unique in that it's able to focus um, right at its edge around pretty complicated focal surface. And then you've got <coughs> what's effectively a rear projection TV. But you know, when you go to the side of a rear projection TV, it gets dark. Right. This is equally bright all the way around, so it's a very specialized kind. And this, this system costs $2,500, or is that the AIM job? It costs no, this, the, the system that we sell to schools today, um, this size costs about $11,000. And we're in the process of raising money to drive the price down to, uh, down to $2,500. So I have $5 million worth of orders in my hand uh, for a $5,000 system that I have to finance, among other things, and then design and tool the $2,500 system. So the world is not flat anymore after all. Yeah. No, when we first started, we were, we were talking to the Flat Earth Society about, uh, about using the, the um, tagline, the, the Earth is no longer flat. But the person that ran it died, and it kind of. <laughs> I, I'll give you my quick, really quick thoughts. Um, so I think it's pretty amazing. You know, I have a six-year-old. Um, you know, I, I I just bought him a globe, and that costs you know a hundred dollars. So I right. thought this is twenty-five hundred dollars. I was like, God, why did I not buy this? But at eleven thousand, it's a different different story. So I sure. think the price, obviously, you know, it's going to have an impact on adop sure. on adoption. Now, when I when I look at systems like this and seeing how you know my kid is interacting with this, you know, I almost see this as you know, what FIRST Robotics has done for engineering and people really, kids getting, getting excited about engineering, I could see this for science. You know, this, mm -hmm. is, this excites me um, mm -hmm. and, and I'm not necessarily a science geek. So I, I think this is amazing. Um, if you get the price down, yeah. you'll probably get parents to donate it to schools. Well, the 8-inch system will probably do that at the same time as the um, $2,500 system this size. Um, that'll run initially about $1,000. So, um, And uh, the examples I gave were fairly science-y, but in fact, where it's used most broadly, it's used in social sciences like history, global history, right. and, and so on. So it's used much more broadly than just science. So overall, it's very cool. Um, I think a lot of it's going to come down to cost mm -hmm. because this is a limited set of curriculum. It's going to be geo-based geo curriculum, social sure. science, et cetera. You're probably not going to teach photosynthesis right. as a core subject here. Yep. And <clears throat> if you look globally, the MOEs, the Ministry of Education, uh, worldwide are looking to put in smart boards uh -huh. as, as a standard. So you have an additional video element there. Sure. So one of the questions is how does your platform also play with the video smart board okay. as existing in the classroom? All right. So the interactive whiteboard market, um, they sold about $1.2 billion last year. It was about $300 million in the, uh, in the U.S. Um, next year, they expect about one in six classrooms to be... Uh, to be uh, uh, to have interactive whiteboards, um, so this is this is complementary with the yeah. interactive whiteboard. Um, so you saw the lesson that would be up here on the interactive whiteboard, and you'd be touching you'd be touching that. From a business perspective, uh, that's great for us. The interactive whiteboards are sold almost exclusively through resellers, uh, and they're starting to see a flattening of their business. So this at twenty five hundred dollars is a product sold to the exact same customers at basically the same price, and it's really attractive. I mean, that's the channels we expect to use outside of the U.S., outside of China, rather. How many of them have you sold today? Uh, so all together, uh, we have sold probably 1,500, something like that. Um, now, in terms of the number we have, we have delivered, it's probably closer to um, 400. Um, I just have a lot of orders that I've got to... And how has the price gone from... How did you get to, to 11,000? Was did you start at 25,000, or are you halfway there? Or? Uh, so originally, our company started selling to um, selling big ones to museums, planetariums, aquariums. Our lowest price system when we started was fifty thousand dollars, and so it was a little bit of a chicken and egg. We had to get the price down to where schools could start using them, um, and so over time, the the price has come down to uh, eleven thousand, and the next jump is probably to six thousand, and then to um, have, have schools thought about, or have you thought about, bringing it in on a per week basis to a school? Because if the curriculum is finite, that would be taught on this. Mm -hmm. If you could say, my school can bring it in for a thousand dollars for one week a year, and not have to do the outlay, and you rotated it, you know, in one of these services, twenty schools a year, mm -hmm. that might be enough to just jumpstart the curriculum, get people right. interested in it. The rental model work um, so with, with a facilitator, you know. So the way it typically gets into schools right now is that museums around the country take their curriculum and bring it into schools. And so you're actually competing with a free, uh, a free model where... Ah, so the Smithsonian might bring one of these in and 
do free education out of school? Uh, right. Um, but uh, well, they, they haven't been to my son's school, so I think, I think there's something <laughs> what Jason says yeah. into it. Uh, but we just sold uh, we just sold 200 to an organization that's going to it's going to seed them into to 200 school districts in the U.S. And they have a really interesting model, which is that they have a uh, a, a um, green energy magazine, hmm. and so it's almost like a subscription model. Any school that will distribute this uh, this magazine to their students uh, for free and their parents. Um, can have a magic planet. So, interesting model. One last question on sure. maintenance, which matters to schools a great deal. Can you talk a little bit about either how fragile the systems are and whether there's an expensive replacement cost for light bulbs, which for smart boards has been a big deal for schools? Um, right. So, the, um, uh, the system we sell into schools right now is an LED hybrid, so there are no, um, there are no um, bulbs to change. Uh, the the lower cost system, um, twenty five hundred dollar system, will probably have light bulbs, but it's just the same as any other. Joe, what do you projector. think? You're a teacher. Uh, something that would interest you? Honestly, um, honestly, is what we're looking for. Yeah. Uh, our biggest goal is to get as much technology into the students' hands. This, I see troubling in um, multiple things, in multiple in aspects. Is most schools are mounting their projectors on on the top of the you know, on the ceiling. Sure. And this is another projector, another bulb. That, like sometimes schools lose funding and they don't have enough money to right. um, redo the bulbs. And I actually disagree with your comment on interactive whiteboards. I think that kind of peaked. And I think tablets and wireless streaming, like through Apple TVs, is what's actually going to replace interactive whiteboards. So I think there's actually going to be a strong dip in the interactive whiteboard market. Um, there's already a dip in the interactive whiteboard market. It's flattening off. I was mostly talking about it from the standpoint of, of channels. Um, so think about it this way. At $2,500 um, and the kind of efficacy, by the way, the U.S. studies, smaller, have, have um, uh, echoed that. At $2,500, there's like one in every school, right? And that, that at the, this size, is a $4 billion market worldwide. Um, when you start to add the, an LED-based eight-inch system, it goes up to sixteen billion dollars. Yeah, this is one in every school, not one yeah. in every classroom. Yeah. So at yeah. that at that point, yeah. it kind of makes sense. But your is a really interesting point, Joe. You believe that AirPlay, the ability to take what's on my iPad and project it onto a big screen, and then have that sort of pass around the class, so different people, kids who are presenting, that's the future. That is the future. Right. I agree with you. Uh, uh, let's I, hear it for I, a moment. We have to go ahead, yeah. last comment. I think, yeah. I think Jason's in on something is it's hard to do field trips right now. It's hard to fund field trips. If you add this to a part of a package to a mobile, I've seen like my kindergarten student didn't have opportunity to go on a field trip this year, but there was like three field trips that were brought to him, like right. the zoo and like, you know, right. different things like that. I think that is it. Right. And also I wonder, teachers have to take, like you have teachers who have to take days off. So if you have to hire a sub for that day, so I wonder if this was like a sub, the cost of a sub times three, maybe that would even be efficient as well, right? So if exactly. you knew somebody had to be out for a maternity or whatever for a week or two weeks, paternity. Or if you, if you, you, need, if you even need to take a grade level and have them do like a planning day, then you bring in something like this and then you're not wasting that day. Oh, I see. So if all the teachers from sixth grade have to go into a planning session, they all go to the auditorium and spend a day with this. Or no, the teachers go and plan for, for the classroom, but you bring in someone to demonstrate. Yeah, that's so what I'm saying. Like, yeah. Really just, yeah. Okay, uh, let's hear it. Uh, yeah. for Global Imagination. That was awesome.